7% failure rate. That is awesome. So maybe there's something to be said about flipped classrooms. Okay. Well, um, let's go ahead and check out a little um, video here. My ultimate goal, I guess, as a teacher is to help students become learners who can learn for themselves and by themselves. So one of the problems that I was guilty of even prior to flipping my classroom around was the classroom was centered around me. I told them exactly what to learn, how to learn it, what assignments to do to learn it, and when to learn it, and how to prove to me that they learned it. I don't do that anymore. We changed the place in which content is Instead of standing in front of the class and delivering, here's how we do this type of problem, here's how this works, um, I deliver that direct instruction now asynchronously at home through these videos that we make in the studio. I'm still home. Well, we can do that the last time. step, they were already whole numbers. We got one, one, and four. Here we don't have a whole number. So here's a few little tricks when you need to multiply by whole numbers. If one of your numbers ends in 0.5, you're going to multiply by two. Something 0.5. Right. Write this down. Yes. If something ends in 0.3 or 0.33 or 0.66, you multiply by three. Kids come to class. They don't show up to learn new stuff. They show up to apply the, the things that they learned at home and to ask questions about the things they learned at home. So now they can have my my lesson, if you will, what I would normally have stood up and lectured to in class and some added features they did that at home. Then what they were expected to do for uh, for homework is now going to in my class. Life is different for me because I don't, I no longer am the guy who stands up in the front of the classroom and just yaks at a student for now, or like however long the class is. Now, I walk around the class and I help kids. I have a tutor, a guide, I have the putter out of fires, whatever it happens to be um, in my crazy chemistry class, I walk around and do that. I don't stand up front and teach. I'm just being kind of a traditional model. I'm Aaron Sands. I'm a teacher. I'm a dad, I'm a husband, I love Camp David students. Awesome. Okay. So, uh, first of all, um, I didn't know this was like bring your own stool. I obviously am too short for this non podium. Um, but how many people in here watched the homework assignment that we sent out to the class? Okay. Okay, so most of you did your homework. That's great. So, um, what did you think about the video? What, why, go ahead. Oh, just, right, just, just, did you um, catch the part where Salman Khan said his cousins preferred the video of him over their real life cousin? Well, why do you think that is? Um, I said sometimes where I have kids said the same thing, where they have the videos because they felt bad, like, Front of their peers raising their hand and stopping to ask the question because they felt like a they were wasting time and b they were embarrassed to ask what they thought they should know it already and they should be getting it and with the videos they can rewind it 18 times i've had kids where they were in the classroom watching them i've walked behind them and i've watched them they just kept rewinding and rewinding and rewinding and seeing the same example over and over again until suddenly it clicked and i can't really feel like they can do that with a real person without somebody getting frustrated so um, they feel a little bit safer. Um, they feel like it can actually go at their own pace, and they don't have to bring any, you know, hold anybody else back in the class if they don't. <coughs> okay. Anyone else have any thoughts on that? Yes. My mother used to lecture on silly and she physician's assistant, but embarrassed me a little bit. They mentioned talking about my brother, but the. talks about the power of pull, push versus pull. 
Um, you're not pushing it on the students. The students are actually determining when they want to learn. They have some control. They have some ownership. And um, they have choice. Choice is a very powerful thing. Anyone else have any thoughts on that? I think overall we're empowering our children to take ownership about what they learn. And there's nothing more wonderful than that than to see that happen. And I think this is a, this is a big, big turning place for a lot of our students. I love that, empowering. You know, they're um, empowering our students. If we can empower students, um, that alone sometimes makes the difference. Yes? There's another aspect to talk about, too, because it is asynchronous. It's not face-to-face. -face, and that's the way the business world is now. You, you're doing everything asynchronous. You don't know your bosses and discuss. Even conferences can be kind of separated and doing it different times. So it's good uh, real world now. They don't realize it, but it's happening in the real world. That's a really good point. You know, we're, we're not only trying to prepare our kids with the content that we want them to learn now, we're trying to prepare them for when they leave us. And so what an awesome model of the modern workplace or our modern world. And we do many things asynchronously. In fact, I think that's more common nowadays than synchronous. So um, it's about time, I guess, that our classrooms kind of model that. That's awesome. So, um, did you, what did you guys think about the point that he made about flipping classrooms humanizes the classroom? What did he mean by that? You spend more time one-on-one -on -one with kids instead of just doing a whole group trying to grab them all, just go one at a time and adapt to their whatever level of or pace they have. Absolutely. So you get to make those connections, those personal connections with students that you might not have had the time to make um, in a traditional style. Any other thoughts on what he means by <coughs> humanizing or how it can humanize the classroom? Yes? Like for some kids, if it is, you know, if you, if you get a really bright kid and you're trying to lead it as a whole group, for the bright kid, this is more interesting. For the kid who doesn't understand, this is frustrating because you're going through the test. For the teacher, it's frustrating because these guys can't keep up, or these ones are too far ahead, they can't keep up challenges. There's a lot of them. There's a level of frustration that can set for the It's very interesting. It's hard to uh, teach to so many different styles and so many different levels all in one room. And so this kind of uh, allows that to happen easier. It's easier to engage a larger class size, uh, more students with this model. Okay, any other thoughts on that? Okay. Um, we talked about, or this video was specific to Khan Academy. That's, you know, not the only resource out there for flipped classrooms, but how does Khan Academy promote mastery? Right, it is like 
video games. It's funny, it's, um, you know, if you can't beat them, join them, you know? Kids are into gaming, we know that. So let's see how we can kind of take, take some of those characteristics and apply it to learn. Um, let's take another look at a video here. <coughs> Familiar? <laughs> just, I was just testing you to see if you guys were paying attention. Let's see. Here we go. I'm Jonathan Bergman and I work at Little Park High School. There was kind of a moment of revelation. At the end of the year, my kids do a big final project. One of the pieces of the final project is a uh, interview. I interview them and ask them three conceptual questions about the data that they during the course of the year. And some kids, more kids than I were just happy with, didn't really get it. It's like, what are you doing? They're asking me. If you don't understand this, you really haven't almost been in my class. And they had not so it was just, it's a disturbing. And that's kind of what made me think there's got to be a new way. Well, we went to a master's <coughs> where students, when they get the end of the unit, they have to master the content. So when they completely um, have a past the objectives, they have to meet, meet a minimum requirement, which is 75%. So when they meet that minimum requirement, they can move on. If they don't, then they have to go back and do what they do. So that sort of assured that they'd actually done So the big thing has been mastery. But the recordings have been huge because it frees me up to walk around here. The surprises that we've had that have been really amazing is that I can differentiate for all of What that means is that if I've got a kid who is a rocket scientist, I can challenge him in this mastery system. And I've got a kid who really struggles with my content. I can challenge him. In the old system, I had to kind of shoot for the middle. Now I can actually have all of the levels. Every kid kind of gets a different education. I think that's okay. My name is Jonathan Gordon. I'm a teacher, a father, a husband, a triathlete, and I love him. All right, so um, he was talking a lot about um, differentiation. We talked about earlier um, how frustrating it is sometimes to meet all of the levels we have in our classroom, um, and how we talked about um, how ridiculous it is to expect kids to be able to ride a unicycle if they don't even know how to ride a bike. Um, I think it's equally ridiculous to expect that 30 kids are going to be able to progress and learn at the exact same pace and move on. Um, so flipping classrooms kind of takes some of that out of our hands. It kind of allows us to differentiate more easily. Uh, what are some other benefits of flipping a classroom? Yes? Um, since I've taken the lecture out of the room, they and isn't that the fun stuff not just for kids but for us too for teachers mm -hmm. so now we have the time to do the fun things you know the things that we didn't always feel that we had time to do what are some other benefits When I first became a teacher, um, I constantly went home without a voice or a very hoarse, hoarse voice. Um, that was probably the thing that I loved, liked the least about teaching, you know, one prep or, or the same thing over and over and over. I mean, that, you know, kids, we want to mix it up for the kids. You know, we, want to, we don't want to do the same thing over and over either. So it not only makes it more interesting for the kids, it can actually make it more interesting for us too because we're it's kind of taking that part away. We're just, you know, saying it one time or none. If there's already a resource out there, why reinvent the wheel? And uh, we're able to spend the time working with the kids and interacting with the kids, and that's what we're all here for. Okay, uh, yes?
longer get calls from all of my relatives wanting me to help them with their kids' math homework anymore, you know, because I can actually direct them to some of these sites. Um, one of my cousins um, had, you know, posted on Facebook that she just hated math and she was so frustrated with, you know, I don't know, fractions or whatever topic, sent her a video and she was like, wow, thanks, you know, that really helped because I could, I could rewind it, I could just skip over the parts I already knew and it basically just was tailored to exactly what she needed. Did you want to make a point? Well, if you record it once and you are consistently delivering the instruction all day, but you know, by eighth period, you're tired. <laughs> Can I say that already to this class? Oh, Lord. So there's no mistaking in what you're delivering. That, there. That's a very good point. Um, you know, it's like my poor first period when I was a first year teacher. You know, it's like. By eighth period, I had it down, and you know, you learn all these things along the way. <laughs> but um, that first period class, it's like you know, every day I'm just like thinking, you poor things. Who knows? You know, who knows what I'm gonna, what I've forgotten to say, um, and I don't, I don't have to worry about that. It's very consistent. They're our triads. What? The first period is our hour tryout. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Our hour then, tryout. Yeah, and then by by the eighth period, I don't know, not only us. But they're tired too, and they're most of the time the most talkative class because they want to, they just want out, and so that's when we lose our voice too. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. You have proof, <laughs> right? It's no longer our word against theirs, yes. That's good if you're going to be honest. Very good point. If you're absent, um, they can they still know where to go. Um, and to me, that sounds like they have opportunities to take more ownership over their learning rather than waiting on the you know the one person to provide them all of this you know secret information. You know, um, so not only does it allow the information to be accessible, it sends a message to them that you know you're not the whole keeper of all of this information. You know, it's out there, and they can seek it out. Christy, kind of going along with that, I, what I've been trying to get my students to realize is, although I'm giving you this one video to watch, that's not the only resource. You're on the internet, go find something else. If you're having trouble understanding this one, find another video. And I'm asking them also, if you find another video that's good, post it on the discussion board to share with everybody. Wonderful. So you're teaching your kids how to um, help each other and to collaborate <coughs> and um, that they're all in it together, that every, you know, everybody's learning together. That's, that's a great strategy. Anyone else have anything to share? Uh, yes? Um, something I've noticed as I've flipped is that sometimes you get unexpected results. Um, teenagers always like to push the limits or see what's going on. And they are like, I hate this video. I don't like it. And I just use the book. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I didn't even know what to say. Um, I was like, yeah, they're, they're pretty dusty over there, but you, you certainly may use them. And, and they go and they grab the book and index what we were looking for and find it and take those from there. So sometimes they finding other resources, even if it's not online, um, is a good reason. You know, it helps them find their own path to the same information. Awesome. It indirectly um, somehow entices them to use a textbook or just to find other resources for them. So um, it's more, it's not just the fact that we're giving some information to them. Again, you know, we're sending that message, helping them understand that they are in control of their learning and there's lots of resources out there for them to use. Okay, well, this has been a great discussion. Um, we're going to kind of jump off of this and continue on and hopefully got, you guys are going to be able to learn um, some techniques. Um, somebody mentioned there's been some challenges. We're going to see if we can overcome some of those and um, exactly how you can go about flipping your classroom. So Dawn, I will let you take it away. I found it interesting when preparing for this presentation that I actually flipped my learning too. I found some resources and they were short videos and I watched them and then I was able to prepare 
some information for you. So I thought that was interesting that I was also flipping also. So we're going to look at some of the challenges that you may face. Some of you have already spoke of those, and so let's see some more. But before we do that, I'd like to look at one video. And several of these videos are on our website that we have that Bob will share with you at the end. But uh, first I thought we should look at this as a paradigm shift. And I want you to watch this video. Several of her videos uh, are short and brief, but hit many of the things that you may encounter. Because you want to think that flipping your classroom is not just sending students home with a lecture video to do the same thing that you're in a class. It's flipping more than that. And in this video, I'd like for you to pay attention to what they say about the students that are in the middle. We've already touched on it helps the kids and the high kids that they're able to uh, extend their learning. It helps the low kids. We're able to help them. But listen to what they say about the kids in the middle.
Do they have gaming devices? So there's alternatives, but that's one thing we want you to think about before you do this. We want you to come up with a plan. What am I going to do to accommodate those students? So one thing that we provided on the website is the uh, flip classroom agreement. And you will be filling this out, getting your administrator to sign it, and then turning it into the tech department up here. And notice the things that you'll have to do. You'll have to discuss this with your administrator, notify your administrator that you're going to be doing this. You'll have to notify your parents, tell them what we're going to be doing with this flipped classroom concept. You'll have to verify what resources your students have outside the classroom and come up with an alternative <coughs> to their lack of access. So, that, so those are some of the things that you're going to be looking at. And then on down in the one page, uh, form that you fill out, you're going to also say why you believe the flipped classroom concept would benefit and what your plan for this year. It doesn't have to be extensive. It can be a baby step in what you're really going to do to implement this plan this year. And then you get that, you sign that, you have your it sign that because they will be involved with you and your principal and then you submit it up here. Now one thing you might want to add to that are things that might assist you in making this be more successful. And so when we look at these applications, if we think that this is uh, something viable, then we will uh, maybe assist you with these uh, uh, things that you need to make your concept more uh, ready for your students. So that's one thing that we have available. The other thing uh, you might want to think about are administrators that don't understand your concept. You that have started it, or uh, if you have some thoughts to throw in here too, how have you gotten your administrators on board? How, how have you or how could you get them on board? administrators going to think when they come in your classroom and see instead of you standing the, up there lecturing your content what what do you think they're going to see in your classroom well, they're going to see us walking around actually helping students one-on-one -on -one and really getting to know the students and talk to them about their concerns and out. meeting the needs of the students you think you'll be raising the rigor of the classroom check 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 Excellent. Student center. That's what it's all about. So I'm thinking that won't be a problem once they see what you're, you're doing, but they want you to have a plan. Uh, what about inconsistent campus implementation? What does that mean anyway? Thank you for 
what about uh, parents that don't understand the concept? We actually have a letter for you to send home uh, to the parents, and remember that's one of the requirements that you uh, talk with your parents about your plan, and so you'll be able to use this letter to send home to your parents. At the bottom, it says, uh, the this activity often requires internet access. If this causes any concerns, we can work out alternatives. Please feel free to contact me. Okay? So those resources are available to you. All right, what about students who don't watch the videos? Exactly. Do you now send all of your class time focus on that kid now? Why would you in a flipped classroom? That kid then does not get the benefit of using class time to work on the assignment or whatever practice or whatever it is because he's sitting in the corner watching the video in the classroom. So you have them watch them in the classroom, right? Okay. Any other solutions that y'all found? Well, my question to that is really if you don't have enough technology to go around to the students that are doing their assignments, but also have this other kid off on the side watching the video. That's the problem we're running into. Well, I'm in the world of one to one. Yeah. One of their solutions in these videos was, uh, you know how every year that I'm not at every school, but. We have a lot of teachers that get new laptops. What do they do with the old laptops? The really old ones. And what they had done in this class was take those really old ones and all that was on there was her video content. And so they used those extra computers for that. So I thought that was a, a good idea, something to think about. I don't know if that's possible. Um, I wanted to just to watch and see what, how she handles this. I'm Katie Gilbart, and I'm answering questions about my flipped classroom. This question comes from Bill in Minnesota. What if students don't watch the videos? Well, this is always an interesting question. First, I think you have to require something of the students to ensure that they are doing their part, that they're interacting with the information. So I have them take notes. That might look different for each teacher. I expect them to copy down definitions, copy down a couple of examples, and, and go through the material. So requiring that of them, you know quickly who has done what they needed to do to be prepared for class. Of course, there's always going to be students that don't do their part, that don't do homework for whatever reason. And these students are easily identified in the classroom. You can take them, send them back to a computer right away, and have them do what they need to do while the rest of the class can move through the information and get started. The other aspect is, for those students that don't do the work, some of them might write down the bare minimum or not go through the full information on the video. That's to be expected. Well, what they do is they start collaborating and working in groups with each other, and that's not a bad way for them to learn through peer teaching and delving into and applying the information. If they have some gaps in the information, they'll usually call you over and say, yeah, I don't get this part. Can I go back and watch the video again? And that's great. That they can use that video at any time to fill in those gaps. The other interesting aspect of it is that my students, because class is more engaging, more social for them, it's more collaborative. They often want to be a part of what's going on in the class. I've actually had students come to me at the beginning of the day and say, Ms. Martin, can I go ahead and get on the computer now or during lunch because I didn't watch last night's video, I didn't have time and whatnot. And my answer is yes, because it's great they now see the value in being a part of the classroom and what's going on inside the class. For more information about flipping the classroom, visit the Friday Institute's website. You know, that's what, something else I was thinking about. All the grants that we have that you can get, maybe iPod uh, touches for your videos, your lack of the computer access also that you can use in the classroom. All right, students are disruptive. How this problem in your flipped classroom? Students who are disruptive. She also brought the point up that there, it's a social, it's more social for them, more collaborative, and that's what they like. But she's in the real world, I liked it, because she talked about having classes of 37 students. Um, she said, you're going to have those kids that are disruptive. They're gonna be days, they're gonna be like that. What do you normally do? You follow the protocol <coughs> that you normally would in the classroom if they're being disruptive. But here's the beauty of what happens. What about those kids that are really disruptive and they, they are sent to alternative. What? 
That's what's excellent. What happened before the flipped classroom? What did I have to do as a teacher when they went off to somewhere else? They read the papers. Yes. And you had to prepare a bunch of work, right? And you just hope it gets done. Yes. You hope they figure it out on their own with whatever or lack thereof resources that there might be. And what happens now? <coughs> they know exactly what to do. I would say I just had a girl out for two weeks that she had knee surgery. Came back today and took a test. She had one of the highest scores in class. Asked her, what'd you do? Oh, I just picked up with your videos. I just had a new student come in today for my AP Biology class. We're already six weeks into the school year, and his AP Biology teacher from another district was using a different scope and sequence. And so he's like, well, I'll just go on the website and I'll catch up with the class. I'll be ready by tomorrow. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nothing else she actually talked in the video about, she was teaching an Algebra one class, and the students were in an algebra class that was too big, and so semester they took those algebra students, the higher kids of the algebra, al play, the algebra class, and moved them to the algebra one class. Right. They don't have the background. But what did she do? She had those videos and caught them up like that. She said that's when she started her flip classroom, that it made a difference. Another point she brought up was disruptive students. What she, I have not thought of this either. She takes her, dis, she groups them by abilities and how they get along and things, but sometimes she takes that group of disruptive students and puts them all together so that she can go and work with them and teach them not only the concepts, but the skills, the management skills, the behavior skills that they need to be successful. So I thought that was an interesting thing to think about. All right, uh, managing self-paced instruction. That sounds Sounds like I'm going to be managing a lot of things here. What do you think? What? The only thing that that's not the stuff that's all the videos are in the hand, you just as soon as you call it, who's doing this, you're going to watch this. For me, the, the big stopping point is I've got to create a bunch of videos. That, that's the key. Where do I find the flip camera? There's only a couple on the yeah, I can use my cell phone, that's fine too, but I still need to find the time to create the content to send home to them. Excellent. For yes. I've only created one since school started. There are so many to choose from on like YouTube and TeacherTube and Khan Academy that I have been able to find a video that just exactly matches what I need without having to create it. Excellent. I mean, not that I don't intend to create my own, it's just right. new preps, new classes, new everything right from getting me here, and I haven't had time to do a lot. Well, self-paced, one thing she, she made it a uh, point on the self-paced, the, the, the content, the process is self-paced, but when we take an assessment, everybody does it on the same day. So you're not alternating that. You're, you're controlling that. Another thing she made the point of was that you don't watch a video every night. You give them a time frame and you have two to three videos a week. Is that what you find? Yeah. With working with the freshmen, I've had a really good luck with I give them Monday, Wednesday, Friday. It's always due Tuesday, Thursday, Monday. So like this week, we will only have Wednesday and Friday. And that pattern, that repetition in routine has really helped them get a grip on, oh, I have homework. Do I have homework tonight? Is it Wednesday? Is it Wednesday? <laughs> no, then they know the answer. That's helpful. Well, that leads to your question, uh, the, the time and resources. How do I get this done? Actually, after the principal started seeing what this teacher was doing in her classroom, he got on board with her and he started helping out to spread this throughout the team. So they had, and you may not have this, but you may have a closet. They had an empty classroom. So they had everything set up and it was the bare minimum. The videos that she did is the, the method that she uses to, uh, do her flip classroom. And so all she needs is whiteboards, and she slides those whiteboards <coughs> across the chalk tray. She needs uh, markers. She needs a flip camera. She needs a tripod and a chair, and that's it. And they set this up in the classroom, and so I, all the teachers that were going to use this, they come in the classroom, and, and they have this all there. All I have to do is sit down in the chair, push record, and it's a one-take thing. You don't edit it or anything. 
you do one take and download it to your computer. So I thought that was another good thing, administrator support where you maybe just have a pause, but have the materials ready. You only need that for one group, and then everybody can share that. Interesting thought. Well, you talked about in elementary was having maybe while you're taking a lesson, one of the students actually record that one lesson. So you don't yes. have to do any extra work. I mean, you're going to do it anyway, but save it as so they can refer to it later. And John's going to show you how to do some of this. He's got some great ideas, to, to, to ways to do that also. So time, I know, it's, it's, it, it takes time, but you've got to have a plan. Yes? Um, now with our little webcams here, the website called screencast and have it, you yes. can do it totally for free, or 15 bucks a year if you want to upgrade it. So it's really John is going to demonstrate that. And I really, I, that's the first time I've seen that, and that's excellent resource. But I want us to finish, I want us to look at shifting responsibility because isn't learning about students taking their own responsibility in their learning? And so let's think about that. I'm Katie and Mark, and I'm answering questions about my flipped classroom. This question comes from Ian in North Carolina. How does this shift some responsibility from the teacher to the student and the parent? Well, prior to flipping the classroom, I, as the teacher, had to take on all the responsibility. I spent all of my time preparing my lectures, going through the information, and when students were you know, sick or absent, I had to take them through that information <coughs> that they may have missed. When students were distracted or weren't paying attention through the lecture, it was still my responsibility to get them through the material again. Students that were suspended, whatever the reason, the teacher was responsible for making sure they got the information that they may have missed for whatever reason. Now, through flipping the classroom, this information is out there for my students. There's no longer the excuse of, well, I wasn't here, I missed you going over this, or I was in you know, um, the doctor's office or in, in school suspension. My videos are there for them to always see. So it puts more of that onus on the student. They no longer can have, use those excuses that they miss the teaching. The other interesting aspect of this is parents. When they come into meetings, I've sat in a few parent conferences where they looked at you know, my team of teachers and said, well, what, are, what is being offered to my student? What things are you doing to help them improve? They're struggling. And they looked at me and said, well, I know that you do those videos, so there's no excuse there. And I've seen the, the kid kind of hand the call. I don't have an excuse. So the parents want to take that active role. And they love being a part of what's going on in the classroom. Other parents have looked at me and said, it's been years since I've taken algebra, and I used to do it a little different way. This is so great that I can see how you're telling them to do that, and I can reinforce that at home. It's helping to build those relationships with parents and teachers, and also helping to put some of the responsibility back on them for their child's learning. To learn more about working in the classroom, visit the Friday Institute's website. Something to think about. Don't we always want to make them more responsive? So a great way to do that. The, the last video that I had on there is why it has to be me. So I'll pick your interest on those videos. Those are on the website. And she makes the case for why it's good to have those con videos and those type of videos, but also why some of your videos need to be from you. It, it tells the parents and the student that you are interested in them, that, you, that it gets them to buy into what you're doing. It has, builds that trust with you, that you know what you're doing, and it builds the relationships with them, that you, you're taking the time to make those videos for them. So some uh, excellent resources on our website that Bob will share with you in just a moment. So now we're gonna move to Keith. So now we're going to look at uh, the best practices and what this really looks like in your classroom, the best way to go about making all this happen. So the first thing, and I think someone mentioned it earlier, was to keep the video short. If you've watched Khan Academy videos, those typically are five to ten minutes long. And, you know, as we know, you know, in the classroom, we lose our kids' attention if we talk and drone on a lot, a lot of things. 
So it's best to keep the video short. And that's why there, these things like screener, for example, are great because it cuts you off for five minutes. Okay, if you can't talk about the content in five minutes, then you need to look at how you're presenting it possibly. Maybe you need to chunk it. If it's a big concept, break it down into smaller bits and make multiple videos. Okay. And there is one more, uh, Paul, and someone mentioned, I think Maria, you did, screencast o matic where the difference between the two of them, the biggest difference, is that Screencast-O-Matic will also capture your webcam. So that video we saw from the guys from Colorado earlier where there was a little image of them in the bottom corner of the video, it will actually allow you to do that and have your, 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 your you see the talking head down there and you talking to the students, but it still captures that screen. And it'll cap you at 15 minutes, but you know that's one of those ones you're kind of bordering on getting way too long in the content. But the great thing about both of them they host on their website, Screener or Screencast-O-Matic for you. You can publish them to YouTube. You can embed them on your own website. Maybe you're using Project Share. Maybe you're using Enmodo. Any of those things. And the nice thing about doing it in Enmodo or Project Share possibly is, um, kind of like we did last night with the Khan Academy video, is and what Katie Gimbar talked about was doing something with it. So maybe the students have to post a discussion board or a thought after they watch that video. So on things like Edmodo or Project Share, you can actually embed those videos into the discussion board posting. Next piece, good content. Obviously, we want to deliver the best content possible for our students, but again, it needs to be concise. Okay, we can't, you know, ramble on and ramble on. So, chunking it. Five to 10 minutes max on a video making sure that they see everything they need to know on the screen. If you're working out complex math problems, working out science problems, that you know, you're not skipping steps, that you're actually writing those things on the screen so they can see them as you go along. You can always refer back to them, stop, rewind, as they will do many times on that. Okay. Getting feedback. Okay. When you first start this, um, you may not think that you covered everything or you may have missed something as you're doing it. And it's good to get feedback from teachers in your department, at your school, maybe even your, uh, your coordinator at the admin building about making sure you're covering it, making sure it's easy to understand for the students. They know what's going on when they're listening to those videos. It's easy, easy for them to digest. And then even after um, you've had the students watch it, get feedback from them. We grade our students on their performance on things all the time. Why can't they give us feedback on how we present things? And here's an example of a feedback form that, oops, let me just roll down there, there we go. Um, a, a form that the teacher had not only people in her school fill out, but also students, how she was doing or he was doing on presenting that content in the flipped classroom in that video, okay? so. Um, Getting that feedback from the students can really help you revise things, how you're doing, and making sure you're reaching all, the stu all your students, because that, again, that is the point with this. Kills the power. There it goes. All right. Be careful how you say it. <laughs> okay. Although we might delete things off the internet, they exist forever somewhere. Okay. Especially if you say something controversial, the students can download those videos. One of the things I did mention on Screener and Screencast-O-Matic, they are downloadable as well in a format that will play on iDevices or Android devices as well. So the students can watch them on those small devices at home. But again, like I said, be careful how you say it. Make sure that no information is included in your video that um, could harm another student. There's no grades, there's no personal information, things like that. Because you know, again, those videos do live on forever, as we see it happen to athletes and actors and just everyday people. They put something on Twitter and someone takes a screenshot quickly if it's something controversial. Okay. Know the audience you're talking to. Okay. Who are you trying to reach? Make sure that you talk at their level. Make sure it's easy for them to understand you and the content that you're delivering. Post in an accessible place. And this was kind of what I talked about a little bit on the on the, the short video part, but where are your students most likely going to use this or be able to access it? Okay, if they're using a 
uh, a small, you know, their iPhone or their Android phone, it's kind of a pain for them to have to log into Project Share or things like that when they're on that phone and then access that video. So if they're going to be using those a lot, make sure you put it on YouTube or on things like Screener because you can use Screener on an iPhone or an Android phone. Okay, so again, make sure it's easy for them to be able to access and start small. And before I get into this, one, I'm actually going to show again one, another one of her videos and cue it up at a certain point here. <laughs> 